you for your testament of belief. And God bless America. Tonight, with a full heart and deep gratitude for your trust, I accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of rain. We said we intended to reduce interest rates and inflation, and we have. We said we would reduce taxes to get our economy moving again, and we have. We said we would once again be respected throughout the world, and we are. said we would restore our ability to protect our freedom on land, sea, and in the air, and we have. We came together in a national crusade to make America great again and to make a new beginning. It's hard to believe it's been almost eight years since we first came here. It was a springtime of hope for America, and our best days were yet to come. We had a big job to do, but fortunately, we had the people to do it. Talented, dedicated people from all walks of life who gave up so much to come here and serve. When I think of our men and women in uniform, I recall our trip to South Korea. I was so proud to hear, not grumbling or I want to go home, but the spirit with which they carried out their duties there. They're on the frontiers of freedom, and I've never seen such morale, such esprit de corps. It looks good. Such pride in their work. Sir, my name is Private First Class Bruner. I'm from Malibu, California, and I've been in Korea seven yeah. months, sir. Yes, sir. Well, proud to know you. Proud to know you too, sir. I don't know of anything I'm more proud of than those young men and women in uniform today that I see so many times visiting the bases or out on a out on a warship. They are very remarkable. And I will now read the citation. Most of us talk about kindness and compassion, but Mother Teresa, the saint of the gutters, lives it. Anyone who's ever been in this job takes with him so many memories. Memories of the good times, moments that bring a smile, moments that bring you to tears. As president, you share in those moments of triumph. believe in the line I look to the hills from whence cometh my strength. Before I reached my decision to run for re-election, some people thought that maybe I'd be happy to retire to that beautiful ranch outside Santa Barbara and spend the rest of my life enjoying the simple things, riding horses, chopping wood, and spending time with Nancy, being outdoors and close to all of God's natural gifts. But they forgot there were so many things yet to be done. I have been so thrilled and excited to see the turnout of young people at meetings of this time.
you forgive me. I'm going to do it just one more time. You ain't seen nothing yet. God bless you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I just had that great looking forward feeling of, well, I guess it was like being ahead 14 nothing at the end of the first half, and now you're coming out for the second half. Who will ever forget the great ceremony for the lady? I've told Nancy that she's the other woman in my life. She is a beautiful lady. It's not just what she stands for. And that great statue, when you see it up that close, is so very feminine. When those lights came on and she was finally lighted up, it was a very thrilling moment. One of my predecessors, President Franklin Roosevelt, once said, history cannot be rewritten by wishful thinking. My meetings with General Secretary Gorbachev were in that spirit, open and straightforward. I told him, we don't mistrust each other because of these weapons we have and because we're armed this way. We're armed this way because we mistrust each other. And if you and I can eliminate the reasons for this mistrust, that other part, the arms will take care of themselves. Six months later in Moscow, it all culminated in the ratification of the treaty itself. And this ancient city of pinnacles and spires seemed to come alive with optimism and hope. On June 1st at 8.20 a.m. Greenwich time, the era of nuclear arms reductions had finally begun. And for the first time, I thought we could actually look forward to a future not clouded by the threat of nuclear war. General Secretary, to Mrs. Gorbachev, to the relationship that I believe must continue. A war against drugs is a war of individual battles, a crusade with many heroes, including America's young people, and also someone very special to me. She has helped so many of our young people to say no to drugs, Nancy, much credit belongs to you, and I want to express to you your husband's pride and your country's thanks. One of the great days was welcoming Nancy home from the hospital. She's an inspiration to me the way she always keeps her chin up. And yes, always bounces back, no matter what. Everywhere we go, Nancy makes the world a little better. To see her with heads of state, people of other nations, she represents her country very proudly, and she represents it well. And she makes friends wherever she goes. I can't imagine life without her. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan.
Ladies and gentlemen, would you kindly stand for the presentation of the color guard and remain standing and please join us in the singing of the national anthem. and Ronnie. Now I have, um, I have good news for you and I have bad news for you. The Reagans are here, as you certainly can see. And uh, I'll be doing about a 90 minute vocal con uh, concert <laughs> of all the hits I had with Freddie Martin. The bad news is Frank's got the flu. It's around and an awful lot of people have it. And he's sitting down in Palm Springs with a temperature and he feels awful about it and he's leaving on a national tour maybe. But he sends his apologies and of course his love to the Reagans because they're dear friends and he really wanted to be here tonight to be the first to welcome them home because this welcome home party tonight is the first and then there'll be about a series of 350 of them when the Reagans come back here on June 21st. Did you love their Christmas card? The picture of the White House with a U-Haul in front of it. That was cute. It's about two weeks and they'll be here and uh, in our midst. But it, now to officially welcome them back to the state of California is our governor and a very popular one he is and a man who's done a really fine job for this state. The only thing he has to worry about is if Ronnie gets tired of sitting in Bel Air, he might decide to run for governor again. I don't know. I don't want to worry him. But would you give a great warm welcome to George Duke Machian, governor of California. <laughs>
<laughs> and and Don, Don Rickles, Don Rickles is here tonight, uh, but that doesn't bother the president at all because he has faced Sam Donaldson for eight years. <laughs> To California and when you're back home here with me uh, I, I hope it won't bother you to be the second most charismatic person in California <laughs> there there have been very few times in our national experience when we have had a leader who through the strength of his personality and the clarity of his ideas has so positively impacted people throughout the entire world the way President Reagan has done it. <laughs> Mr. President, through your leadership, we have entered a new era. You have made the Reagan agenda America's agenda. And a very important part of that agenda has been the crusade against drugs in which Nancy Reagan has played such a crucial role. Because of our First Lady's tireless efforts, a whole generation of our children now recognizes the dangers posed by drug abuse. And with the money that's raised tonight for the Nancy Reagan Drug Abuse Center, we in California now will be the beneficiaries of her efforts. For all the hard work that you have put in to create a drug-free America, may I extend to you, Nancy, our heartfelt appreciation. And Mr. President, you and Nancy have achieved many great victories because you dared America to be great again. You braved the unknown and you won. And your legacy will be an enduring one on behalf of all Californians. And let me just say on their behalf, thank you both of you for a job well done and welcome home. Thank you very much. The moment I saw her smile I knew she was just my style My only regret Is that we seldom met Though I dream of her all the while she doesn't know that I exist No matter how I may persist Though it's clear to see That there's no hope for me Though I live at 5135 San Claude Avenue And she lives at 5133 how can I ignore that girl next door? I love her more than I can say. Doesn't try to please me. Doesn't even tease me. And she never sees me pass her way. And though I'm heart sore, that girl next door, affection for me won't display. But I can't 
make any days Cause she's married to the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it is wonderful to see them here. Uh, I've never seen two people, well, of course, I haven't been to the White House that many times, but as comfortable in life uh, as the Reagans and in that job. A lot of us here in this room have memories of the Reagans uh, being with them in the White House. I mean, I have an extraordinary one of a Saturday afternoon that they invited me up. It was about the second year of uh, Mr. Reagan's presidency, and I came up in that little elevator to the private floor, and there, there was the president standing in his cowboy shirt. It was Saturday, and Nancy in a little suit, and I had on a black suit and a black tie, I look like Herbert Hoover standing there. And I said to him, oh, gee, Mr. President, you don't have your tie on. He said, well, it's Saturday. And uh, they took me through the floor before lunch. And uh, we saw all the Lincoln bedroom and all the terrific rooms. We came to one room, Nancy said, this is our exercise room. And she went over and turned on all these machines. And suddenly, I was standing in the middle of the room. And Nancy was flying up and down on some kind of machine. And the president was on a treadmill. And I thought, God, I must be going crazy. I mean, how many people in their lives would ever see the first lady flying up and down and the president on a treadmill? <laughs> then she said, come here. I want to show you what I've done with the pipes. And we walked into a little tiny bathroom. And she and I got down the floor. And she said, you see, I put copper piping all. And I looked up and the president was in the doorway and we were both on the bathroom floor. And I thought, God, this is really extraordinary. I didn't think from the history books I read it would be anything like this, you know? <laughs> then we got to their bedroom and they saw, Nancy said, you must see this wallpaper. It has birds, it's beautiful. It was a kind of a circular room. As we started to go through, we passed the bathroom and she grabbed the door like any wife. And I saw that they left their clothes on the floor just like we do. I mean, it wasn't any different. And we just had a great time. And we sat at lunch. And the president, they told me stories about the first couple of days, you know, that they were in the White House. And how uh, one night he just felt kind of claustrophobic. And he went over and he opened the great French doors to the portico and the lawns. And immediately people with machine guns ran out and aimed at him. So he said, I never did that again. And uh, they asked me if I'd ever been there before. And I said, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, a couple of times. I first went there when Jerry Ford was the president, and that was different. Um, we all got our invitations. It was a state dinner for the Shah of Iran. So I told Nancy and the president the story. And uh, uh, John Kluge was my boss at the time. He owned Metro Media, so he gave me his car, his driver and everything. And the driver said, don't you worry, Mr. Griffin, this first time in the White House, I'll take you and your lady. And, you, uh, and I said, well, we go to the East gate, because that's the celebrity gate that it says come through. He said, <laughs> this is the first time. My name is Andrew. I'll take you to the gate. And with that, we pulled up at the main gates in front of the portico, and it was dark, and he rolled down the window, and he said to the Secret Service, Mr. Merv Griffin. Well, a guy couldn't have cared, you know, and the gates open, And we drove in, and there, as I realized, it was dark. There were Marines in full dress on both sides standing. And over here, there was a station wagon with machine guns pointing out the back. And I said, Andrew, I think you, we are in the wrong gate. And he said, no, we're all right, we're all right. And we got down, and I realized the red carpet was down, and there at the top was the president, the first lady, and Henry Kissinger. And I said, oh my God, Andrew, they think it's the Shah of Iran. He said, well, I can't make a U-turn. And I said, well, don't do nothing. Just uh, uh, pull up there and stop. So we pulled up, and this man came down to the thing, and he opened, down came the president, and the band started playing the Iranian national anthem. And I went, oh. help me. And I got out, and I said, hi, Mr. President. We came in the wrong door. And he said, oh, Merv, it's OK. And a guy from the State Department said, don't step on the red rug, please. And um, then we had a walk by the band. They were playing, boom. And they ignored us, and we went in. But it turned out to be a nice evening. And came the moment where President Ford got up and, you know, introduced the Shah, and they call his wife the Shabanu. 
So he said, oh, you know what's coming. He said, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, we're very proud to have you here in America. You're a great leader, and uh, we are so pleased to have you here tonight with your beautiful wife, the Chaba Shubi, Chuba, Shababa, Chububa Chaba, Chaba Chib, who the Mrs. Shaw is here, and she's lovely. And that started it all, and we had a great dinner, and the Shah spoke. And then we went into the East Room where Anne Margaret was going to entertain. And he said, Your Majesty, and <laughs> uh, he said, um, and the wife, he said, uh, Margaret Ann, no, he said, um, uh, there's a young lady who's going to be here tonight to entertain. She's not an American. She's a naturalized citizen. She is a citizen now. She came here from Scandinavia. And she worked hard. She was on Broadway. She's been in motion pictures. And she's just terrific. And here she is, a dear friend of Betty and mine. Here is Margaret Ann. And Margaret Ann came out like, my God, that's not my name. And her manager, Alan Carr, went boom against the... It was a hell of a night in the White House, I'll tell you that. But, um, no, that's okay. I don't know why I'm telling Jerry Ford stories when we're here saluting this remarkable couple who have given us all so much. But I've done enough. Uh, I think it's time we hear now from some of their neighbors. Thank God they don't have to live next door to this man. Uh, in fact, I don't even know where he lives, if he's even allowed in the community. But he has something to say about everything and everybody, and I know Nancy and the president have worried about it all day long. You know, the president's going out with the highest popularity rating in the history of this uh, America. <laughs> and this son of a gun is, could destroy it in two minutes, you know? So we'll just cut his microphone. No, he's a delightful guy. I mean, this is a facade. This, he's a lovely man. And inside this lovely man is living a desperate man. <laughs> Don, are you there? Can you turn on the light at his table? Oh, here he is. No, that's, it, the, pres that's the president's table. Please. There oh. he is. Don Rickles, oh. ladies and gentlemen. Don. Thank you, Merv. The introduction stunk. I would just like to say, Mr. President, Mrs. Reagan, for $25,000, the meal was lousy. <laughs> Is he laughing? Take a look. See if the president's laughing. Mr. President, I know it's a late hour, and you're usually napping at this time, but <laughs> Ava Gabor sitting there like hungry is free. Anyway, uh, Governor Duke Majin, I must say your speech, once again, was dull and slow. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm only kidding you, Governor, because I have a cousin that's getting the chair Friday, and I know one phone call could help him. <laughs> this is an exciting night. Not one big name showed up, but I must say, Jimmy Stewart was supposed to be here, but he made a left turn and wound up in Encino someplace. So. Mr. President, try to listen. Anyway, uh, he keeps looking around saying, is George Bush the president or am I still in charge? Nancy, I only make jokes about your husband, and why not? Because <laughs> look at him, he's a funny looking guy. Anyway, uh, Look at this, the whole table went, he's a funny looking guy? That's a joke. I knew you, sir. And you know what, Mrs. Reagan, I know, may I call you Nancy? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> anyway, uh, it worked. Anyway, I must remember, I was at the inaugural four years ago uh, at the president's inaugural, you remember, with Frank Sinatra, who couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately, because he heard Merv Griffin was gonna sing. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> If Frank's friends are here, that's only a joke. He has an uncle of mine he's holding in Brooklyn. Anyway, uh, I know this is a little fast for you, President. We'll try to put it on tape so you can sit home and listen to your radio show and understand what the hell I'm talking about. 
But you remember when you were governor on the Dean Martin show and I made fun of you then. And I make fun of you tonight with love and respect because I say from my heart, Mr. President, really, it's time you walked away. <laughs> George Bush is up in my suite right now saying, I'm going to take over and straighten everything out. <laughs> Merv Griffin, yeah. I tell you this from my heart, you're a multimillionaire. And I tell you from my heart, to me, you're a little dwarf pain in the neck. You really are. <laughs> you sang with Freddie Martin. You were lousy then. You were lousy tonight. <laughs> Frank Sinatra is sitting home now throwing up because he has a tape of your voice. <laughs> I make jokes about Merv. He's my new boss in Resorts International. Mr. President and Mrs. Reagan, I work in Atlantic City. Now, gambling, I know you and the President don't stay up late and gamble, but as soon as you leave office, I'm sure you'll be in Atlantic City going, a nine, a nine. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President. Anyway, uh, phew, it's getting out just in time. Anyway, uh, George Bush would be here tonight, but he's riding around in a car going, Damn it, I'm gonna be in charge of everything. Anyway, uh, I make fun of George Bush. I met him at the inaugural and he was a million laughs. He and Barbara said hello to me and then pushed me aside. <laughs> but I must say, there are many stars here tonight that wanna to salute you. They're all big names. Lou Lipschitz, <laughs> Harry Katz, Al Schwartz, and Tom Donovan. They all gave $50 million to make sure you're the president. Great names like Bob Stacker here tonight. This whole crowd, drop your pants and fire a flare. <laughs> anyway, uh, Cesar Romero, you remember him. You danced with him when you were 12. <laughs> anyway, uh, just off the top of my head, Don Newcomb, the great black pitcher, is in the audience now, and he sat at the table and he asked him to serve the people. <laughs> anyway, uh, Joan Collins, uh, who's sitting over there, hoping and praying her name will be mentioned. Anyway, uh, Jackie Collins, her sister, who's sitting at the other end of the room with a blowgun trying to pick her off. <laughs> but Mr. President and Mrs. Reagan, this is an exciting night. Mary Martin's here. And God bless you, you're a great star. You really are. And I won't say anything derogatory about you because your son has a great deal of money. Anyway, uh, Mike Connors, an old friend, is here, Mr. President, to see you and Nancy. And of course, Jamie Farr, one of the hot stars of our time. <laughs> Marvin Davis, a multimillionaire who carries all his money on him. That's why he looks the way he does. <laughs> and Gary Coleman, that little black little boy who's Four foot one, who I remember at your inaugural, his other one, wonderful thing, what was his name, Mr. President? The other black youngster that I said was a basketball star. Mr. President, these are, these are, are these tough questions? <laughs> and this is the man for eight years made decisions for us and sat in the White House and went, uh, oh, oh, what the hell's the name of the Secretary of State? I know him, I know him. Schultze, Schatzi, Schultze, Mulzi. God bless you. And why do I make fun of you? Because you can't do anything to me in another four weeks. <laughs> You're gonna be sitting on your ranch and your wife's gonna say, clean this up, clean this up. <laughs> He's got eight dogs and they all do it. And he goes, come on, I was the president. <laughs> Maureen Reagan is sitting there laughing, knowing she's gonna come into a lot of money someday. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want to thank Baron Hilton, who walked around the entire cocktail room saying, I'm Baron Hilton. You give him a cookie and he went away. He's a real annoying guy. <laughs> Multi-millionaire. Charles Bronson, who really believes he can knock off the world. So many great stars. And John Gavin, who doesn't believe he's not in Mexico anymore. That was, that was a mercy appointment. That really was. I mean, he and Connie Towers sat around Mexico going, And they wound up waiters in downtown Acapulco. Governor, is this too fast for you? No, just relax. You're gonna be reelected, Governor, really. <laughs> anyway, he's running against nobody. Anyway, uh, may I say, uh, 
There are many stars. My good friend Ed McMahon is here, and he'd stand up, but he fell over a case of beer. <laughs> anyway, uh, and to all of you, you know, you enjoy life. You see the President of the United States sitting here with his lovely wife, Nancy, who has done so much for the drug program. And I make fun of people, and why not? Because I'm an American. And I sit here tonight, and I'm proud. And I see the black man sitting here, and another black man. And I ask you, why? <laughs> why are these black men allowed in here? <laughs> Mr. T is sitting over there with a rifle. As he's laughing, his partner's robbing my house. I have nothing against the black man, Mr. President, and you've done a great job with the black people. You've let them say hello to you. This is great. This is what America's about. Look at you, Carl, Carl's Jr., trying to be at this table, and you can't, because you're an annoying guy. Marvin Davis made a phone call and said, put him at a lower table. And I say to you, gentlemen of the jury, arrest Charles Bronson for killing all those people. But this is a night to remember. Frank Sinatra couldn't be here. Well, unfortunately, I've said that. But we had Merv Griffin, who sang one song. Thank God, one song. <laughs> Merv, you're a multimillionaire now, and you're with Ava. And the two of you sit around saying, if Jaja knew what we have. <laughs> anyway, uh, and what do you have? A Hungarian broad and you just laying in bed with that big stomach going, Wah. Now that joke could cost me a lot of work. <laughs> God bless you, Mr. President. Do you remember on the Dean Martin show many, many years ago, and you were governor then, he had your job. Anyway, uh, remember when you were governor? And you were governor then, and we did the Dean Martin show, and I made fun of you. And you, your picture is on my piano. That's all the pictures at the inaugural. It was so great. Since the inaugural, the way you and Nancy have kept in touch with Barbara and I, it's great. Dinner together, phone calls every day. God bless you. I haven't seen you since the inaugural, and I'm here tonight. And when it's all over, I'm here again. And I don't know why. I don't know why. You never gave me a break. You never invited me to one lousy dinner. One dinner, that's all I asked. I'd even listen to Mary Martin sing. But I'll tell you this. That's a joke, Mary. Anyway, uh, Mary wants to swing. She believes Peter Pan's alive. Anyway, but I must say, Mr. President and Nancy, really, this has been a great night for me. The Reverend Don sits here tonight. He prayed to God. He leaned over to me and said, let's pray to God, and then went <laughs> <laughs> bombed out of his head. Has no idea where God is. Anyway, uh, I, that's only a joke, Reverend. <laughs> But I must say to all of you, you've all spent $25,000. <laughs> and you had a great night. And Merv sits at the piano hoping another number will come up. And if you sing another number, I'm going to have the people throw rocks. <laughs> but to you, Merv, God bless for your great, wonderful hotel. To Baron Hilton, who is still walking around the room with all his 12 kids saying they're not going to get a dime. And to you, sir, and to you, Nancy, really. I don't know how much longer I can do because I stand here knowing that Frank could show up and hurt me. But I must say to you both, from my heart, to you, Nancy Reagan, God bless you for doing such great work with young people. May God be good to you, and may you continue to do your work. To you, Mr. President. To you, Mr. President, on behalf of everyone in this room and from my heart, forget how you register, whether you be Democrat or Republican. I knew you when you were governor. You were a charming man then. I sat and had the pleasure of sitting with your daughter at our table tonight. And I knew I had this table because Merv said, if you get up, you can sit near us. And I must say to you, sir, really, God has given you great strength over eight years of presidency. And now you're going into another world, another life, and a happy one, I'm sure, because you're both devoted and godless. But I must say to you, sir, may God's speed give you strength, health, and happiness together. May you continue to be the man you are. You are a fellow actor to all of us as performers and just people in this room that are human beings. Your popularity is greater than ever. 
you're leaving office with honor and dignity. And I, as an American and everyone in this room, must say to you, God bless you, be well, and be with us forever. That was terrific, Don. And you'll be able to see him in Atlantic City at Trump Plaza. Now, <clears throat> the hell are you laughing? They deserve each other. Are you kidding? Two vicious people. Uh, uh, no, he's terrific. That was good, uh, Don. I mean, no, Don Rickles, not Donald Trump. Don. Nancy just screamed all the way through that. Once again, he won't be invited for dinner for a number of years. A name was mentioned, and you all saw her in the spotlight uh, sitting back there, and that's where she deserves to be always. This lady has uh, given us uh, some of the greatest performances ever on Broadway. I don't remember any show she ever was in that there wasn't uh, a, a wait for tickets for six months. She would open, and you just know the kind of reviews she would get. I mean, she gave us uh, well, South Pacific. Well, you can go on all day about the great shows she gave us and the songs that have lasted that she introduced. Um, as you know, her son has uh, long been a fine performer on uh, Dallas, Larry Hagman, or JR. And uh, she's going to come up and sing. She's long been a friend of the Reagans. She and Nancy were on Broadway together in uh, the lute song. So let me introduce to you now one of uh, America's greatest stars and greatest talents, Miss Mary Martin. <laughs> evening you will see a stranger you will see the stranger across a crowded room remember him never let it go remember that last note go. was that close oh, yeah. sometimes you didn't hear it no? I, I hear the high note and I went never let, let her go. very good very good Oh, isn't this exciting, Mary? If they would pay 25000 just to see the two of us. <laughs> God. Ah. This, uh, th this is really very nice of you to ask me to be here. Are you kidding? We just are thrilled that you are here. How do you like the room? <laughs> I love it. Oh. It's just fabulous. Isn't Shall it? We did it all isn't it nice? Oh, Great performer showroom. Yes, yep. yes. And room service isn't bad here. No, either. it's no. <laughs> gosh. No, it, uh, I'm not used to this. These mics, but can you hear me? Okay. This is a song I'd like to sing for my love friend, that Nancy, and that my love friend, her darling, darling president. And this is really for Nancy, though. And it's shall we do it? <laughs> cold I will feel the glow just thinking of you and the way you look tonight oh but you're lovely with your charm and grace felt in every place there is nothing for it but to love you just the way you look tonight. Through the years, 
your graciousness grows, tearing all fears apart. And your smile that everyone knows touches our grateful hearts. Oh, but your never, never change. Keep that breathless charm. Won't you please arrange it for we love you just the way you look tonight. Just the way you look tonight. <laughs> Thank you. If you need me, I will be nearby, mountain high, valley low. My love follows you until the last, lightning, lightning fast, fast, turtle, turtle slow. slow. Journey, Journey to the North Star, south, south winds blow my thoughts to you. you. If you need me, I will be nearby. Land and gay, willow sad, valley low, mountain high. I've known. I've known this little girl since she was 16 years old. And we really did have a wonderful time in Lute Song. And it was her first show. And then she met, uh, <laughs> you know who, the president. That did it. That did it. That was the last show, first and last. First and last. <laughs> first and last. <laughs> but it's, it's lovely to be asked to be here to sing this special now, Mary. Wouldn't have been right without you. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I've got to explain this. I promised I would. I mean, if Frank thinks he has a problem in Palm Springs with his voice, the two of them have both laryngitis and we're all up there talking like this at the table. So if you heard a little raspy sound there, they both have it good. Well, what a night. This gentleman is uh, Frank's pianist, so you know his intentions were darn good in being here tonight. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Miller is one of the best. Frank had um, Sammy Kahn. Was it Sammy Kahn? Yeah. yeah. Write a special lyric for tonight, so Frank sent me up the cards. I, 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 I don't know it that well, but it's a special song to uh, the Reagans, and I'll sing it for you. So, uh, let's see. It's clear why we're all here. We're here to cheer and sing his praises. This man who had a plan when he began, that still amazes. He had the style, he had that smile, and did his thing in such a whiz way. He made a dove of Gorbachev and did it his way. Now she, as you can see, is totally his loving Nancy A bow, if you'll allow 
Cause even now She's still romancy They're very rare The perfect pair What these two share Is everlasting As lovers they Went all the way It's perfect casting for what is this night what has it got if not real friends then not a lot this is a welcome from us all from all their buddies wall to wall Camp David's rare it ain't Bel Air. Bel Air is my way. They'll dwell where life is swell. Their fine doorbell that each friend pushes. It's done and it's been fun. But Air Force One is now the bushes he was immense but in a sense he may have done it the showbiz way he drove them bats those democrats he did it his way i'll ask you all to raise a glass and drink a toast to total class. He served us well for eight full years, and he has earned our love, our love and cheers. He obviously sure works like me. <laughs> he did it his way. Thank you. <laughs> Those are Franks. I think it's now it's time to bring up the man who is responsible for this evening. Baron Hilton is a giant. You see all the wonderful he, things he does for people and uh, needy institutions every single day. This guy is, uh, he has been very generous to many, many organizations in America, but tonight is really special because it involves a million dollars to a lady uh, who started something and it's working and the momentum is rolling and nobody wants to stop and she doesn't want to come back to California and just sit down either. She wants to keep it going. So let me introduce to you the big boss of Hilton. Here is Baron Hilton. Baron. Thank you, Merv. What a lucky innkeeper I am. Just 13 months ago, our company decided that uh, we'd make a sale of this property to Merv Griffin. And uh, me and a great California welcome home to the President and Mrs. Reagan.
Everyone's photographing the check. I want to acknowledge the unique uh, bronze medallion gifts that you find at all your tables here. They are issued by Harry Winston to all of you this evening. These are classic medallions. They will be minted only one time to commemorate tonight's event. The dies are then going to be destroyed, giving you an authentic heirloom. In about a month, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Reagan will receive theirs, which is being processed in a certain way. It's a four-inch diameter Winston medallion, exquisitely furnished in 22-karat gold. Um, it's an original from which the smaller medallions were minted and will be one of the largest single pieces ever struck. This will also be destroyed to protect against the possibility of any duplications. The medallions are certified by Ronald Winston, president of Harry Winston Incorporated, uh, whom uh, Barbara Davis supports. And we extend our uh, special thanks and candy spelling this evening. Right. That's wonderful, and we look forward to that. Uh, Mr. Hilton, it's going to be so great after January 20th when even Santa Claus can come to the house again. <laughs> but I thank you, Merv. You know, when I saw this lineup tonight, I realized that eight years of the Washington Press Corps was just to get me warmed up for a tribute from Don Rickles. <laughs> But now that I'm about to become an elder statesman, I wonder if that means that when Nancy and I go out dancing, Sam Donaldson can't cut in. <laughs> but to be serious, lately when meetings at the White House have got long and a bit dull, I found myself daydreaming about the ranch. You know, just after he left the presidency, George Washington said, and these are his words, Rural employments will now take place of toil, responsibility, and the solicitudes of public life. And I told George then it sounded good to me. <laughs> I was very moved by what Governor Duke Majin said. Every time I come home for a visit, I ask myself, why did you ever leave? You might say I left my heart in Santa Barbara and L.A. and everywhere else in our state. Now, before I go any further, let me say how much Nancy and I appreciate the work everyone has done to make this evening such a delight. I know the time and trouble that went into it, and let me say a special word of thanks to our dinner chairman, Baron Hilton. And since I've got you here, Baron, I thought I'd mention an idea I had for doing something about the deficit. <laughs> I thought you could give me some advice. It's for the government to go into the hotel business. Now, I know this great place back there in Washington on Pennsylvania Avenue. But we do appreciate all that each of you has done and will do in the fight against drug abuse. I know I've said this before, but while there are many things that I will remember with pride and affection about the last eight years, right at the top of the list will be a, the battle a certain lady began long before it was fashionable to get America's young people to just say no to drugs. It wasn't too far from here, well, in Oakland, where a school child in an audience Nancy was addressing stood up and asked what she and her friends should say when someone offered them drugs. And Nancy said, just say no. And within a few months, thousands of Just Say No clubs had sprung up in schools around the country. At last count, there are 12,000 of them in our schools. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt used to talk about the White House as a bully pulpit. But with her crusade against drug abuse, Nancy has shown that it's not just the president who can use that bully pulpit for the good of America. I've been deeply touched in the last few months when some people that I greatly respect have praised the work of our administration and compared it with a few select administrations of the past. But I must say that to my way of thinking, the work Nancy has done 
can't be compared to the work of anyone ever before. Nancy, I knew for the first moment that I laid eyes on you that you were the greatest, and now the world knows that too. You know, I mentioned a few months back that my new theme song is California, Here I Come. Well, I'm not saying I can hardly wait, but in 15 days, 15 hours, 55 minutes, and 40 seconds, I'll be on my way. I just think of it as Santa Claus arriving for us a little late this year. Well, back to our friends, back to our home, back to chopping wooden on a ranch. So until then, thank you from the bottom of our hearts, and God bless you all. I'll turn it over to my roommate. Well, if I can get past the laryngitis, <laughs> I wish that I could thank each one of you individually for all that you've done tonight and, and your generosity. You, you, don't, you can't possibly imagine what this is going to mean to a lot of children and their parents. And I'll be forever grateful to all of you. And I do thank you very, very much. And I add my God bless too. Thank you.